In a previous video, I've explained about the Poisson distribution by using the example of goals being scored in a soccer match as an example of things that happen at an average fixed rate. I think I used the example of one goal every 20 minutes or a goal every 15 minutes. I don't remember exactly. But that's the idea of what the Poisson distribution is for, to count the number of occurrences of that event if on average it happens once every X minutes and you're asking about the probability of having like five of them or six of them inside of a longer interval of time like 90 minutes for a soccer match, for example. So naturally, I wanted to put this to the test um, by writing an IA and I use the example of very recent soccer matches in the World Cup, which are very interesting and kind of easy to find the data online about the number of goals that were scored in a large number of matches. So I didn't write the whole IA this time. I didn't write an introduction at all because if I was actually writing an IA, the introduction would be pretty much what I said in the other video. Motivation for using the Poisson distribution to describe the number of goals in a match uh, and how that comes from the binomial distribution with smaller and smaller intervals and so on and so forth. So that's exactly what I'm going to do with this data. I'm going to use the different distributions and I'm going to compare them to see which one works best. But of course, I also want to take the opportunity to make a lot of comments about how to write an IA, about the rubrics of the IA, starting from this first table here. Notice that I have named my table. It is called table one. Even if there is no table two later on, you can still call it table one, but I think I have another one later. And right under my table, I have the source of the data. It doesn't matter that the data is something silly, like the number of goals in the matches in the World Cup. Uh, you still looked it up online somewhere and you put that as the source of your data. Put it right there under the table. It's not so funny to say put it under the table. But uh, yes, put the source of the data right here. Don't leave it to the end of the paper in the bibliography. That's what I mean. Just put it right there. And uh, anyway, the table is pretty self-explanatory. It's a frequency table. How many matches had uh, how many goals? I separated it between matches that had overtime and matches that didn't have overtime because then it's 30 more minutes, right? So you expect to have more goals. And that's taken into account in some way later on. But when the data first appears in the table, it's just there. It's separated because they're clearly different things. And then after that, I wrote another paragraph about how not all soccer matches have exactly the same length because there is always some stoppage time in the middle. And again, I looked it up to see on average in the World Cup of 2022 uh, for these games that I'm studying, what on average was the amount of stoppage time. And I found this number of 11.6 minutes. But notice that uh, near the end of the second line of the last paragraph here is when I say added time for this reason. And then I put a little one here. And there is a footnote at the bottom of this page that has the full path of the link where I found that information of 11.6 minutes on average. Again, it's a silly piece of information. Nobody has any reason to think that you're lying about that amount of time. But still, you looked it up somewhere and you have to show all of your sources. And it's very common for us to have websites as sources, right? Much more than books, I would say, for the math IA. And it's important for you to remember that you are writing a paper. You are not writing a website. So you should not make a pretty clickable link that doesn't show all of these weird, ugly names like internet paths. Uh, I know it looks ugly and it's not clickable. But that's it. This is a paper you're writing and the name says it all. You're supposed to pretend like this is going to be read on paper and paper is not clickable. So this is the way that you do it. There is a second footnote from the same paragraph called two. It's somewhere in the middle there. Another source of something that I ended up not even using, but uh, it was part of my thought process while I was writing the IA. So I mentioned it anyway and also to show you more examples of how to write footnotes. So now we have a little bit of pretty mathematical typing here. I know I've talked about this in other videos, but yes, if you're using Google Docs, use the equation editor. Like, don't try to look for funny symbols to represent what you're thinking. Uh, definitely don't type the letter X to mean multiplication. That looks very, very ugly. 
And then when I listed here the four distributions that I'm going to be trying to fit to the goals data, first of all, notice that I have given them all different names. They are X, Y, Z, and W. Before I start doing anything with them, I am defining them. I'm saying X is this distribution, which is a Poisson. Y is this normal distribution and so on. I am defining them clearly before I start doing stuff with it. That's important. And I actually did a thing here that I don't necessarily think is the best, particularly in the W distribution. There is a number there, 3.5273, that doesn't get explained until way later in the page, but at least it's on the same page, so I don't know. You should always try to explain things as quickly as possible so there isn't this tension with the reader uh, like okay so she's showing me these distributions but what do these numbers mean so you should release that tension as soon as possible make sure that you explain where the numbers came from at the first opportunity don't delay it as it is right now i did get to explain 2.6875 before i even typed the distributions which is best if you can explain before because that number is the average number of goals per match according to the calculation that I just did over there. But that number of 3.5 something is explained here in this next paragraph. Um, it is the variance that I got from the data to make the second normal distribution. And this is going to be interesting because I'm going to talk about degrees of freedom very shortly to do the chi-squared goodness of fit tests. And it's an interesting discussion about when and why you lose these degrees of freedom. You start with a table that in this case has seven lines, seven categories, uh, but the degree of freedom already starts at six because there is the thing that all of those categories added together has to add up to the correct total number of goals. You have your observed data and you're going to calculate your expected data to compare them with the chi-squared test. And I actually have four distributions that I am deciding to calculate those expected values from. But I made choices for those distributions. They are a Poisson with parameter 2.68, which came from the data. This number 2.68, this number is the average number of goals in my data. So that requires me to decrease one degree of freedom as well. And the same for the binomial distribution that I used and for the normal as well, because this number appears in all of them. But for the last normal distribution, I also took the variance from the data and used that as the second parameter of the normal distribution. So I lose actually two degrees of freedom. Now let's go back to the table to talk about this other thing that's also mentioned here that is the expected values being less than five, right? We are told in the syllabus of the AI course that that is a bad thing, that you should never have expected values less than five, but we should keep in mind that that's a rule of thumb, right? There is nothing magical about the number five that makes it so that if it's 4.9, then the test is meaningless, but if it's 5.1, then the test is perfect. It can't be like that, right? So, of course, if you find an expected value of 4.9 in an exam question, please combine categories so that you have that number bigger than 5 like they want. But if it happens in your IA, like it's happening with mine, I have a bunch of 4 point somethings here, feel free to use the test anyway, you know, just write a little bit about it like I did. Show them that you are aware of the limitation maybe do two versions of the test, which is what I am going to do and compare the results. But just don't think that there is a magical thing about the number five. And I don't know, I kind of don't like combining categories too much. Uh, I want my degrees of freedom to be kind of high. I don't really know why, but that's just the thing that I feel, uh, especially combining the categories of zero goals or one goal. It feels like a soccer match is so different when it's zero zero or when it's one zero those are not categories that i would choose to combine but the data is in some way telling me that i have to so i did both and the results were not very different you'll see it's an interesting thing to compare things that i can also comment about rubrics here and how to present this kind of data is that i am actually running eight chi-squared goodness of fit tests here so it runs a very high risk of getting repetitive you don't want it to get repetitive so I just 
typed the Nolan alternative hypothesis for one of them, and they said, hey, the others are similar, because they are. The hypothesis for the goodness of fit tests are always the same. They're always this. As for the degrees of freedom, I did write a little paragraph, but it got confusing, so I also showed it in a table. And since I had the table right there, I just used that table to give the results of all eight tests. There are eight p-values in that table, and I did not at any moment attempt to calculate the goodness of fit test by using a formula, because this is not how we do it. Your IA doesn't look better if you try to use a formula instead of just typing it in the calculator for this kind of thing, for hypothesis testing at least. It feels a little bit like trying too hard to show knowledge, and if you have knowledge, you don't have to try that hard. It just shows through your writing. Anyway, that's the end of it. That's the end of what I wrote for this IA. Uh, interesting results, big p-values for all of them, but the Poisson were the biggest ones, which makes me happy, right? Because that's what I was trying to show, that Poisson is the most appropriate distribution for this kind of situation. Sort of an abrupt end to my IA as well, if it finishes on this sentence here. But then again, I wasn't really writing a full one this time, so no introduction, no conclusion. I just wanted to show you uh, the data and a little bit about the presentation. Now, I think I can kind of show you how I got these numbers from that table as well, because I did it in Google Sheets, which is very useful for a lot of these things. So for the Poisson, you can see what the command is that I'm using here. The first parameter is the number of goals that you're asking the probability of. So in this case, I'm writing cell A2 because I'm using the number on the left. And then the second parameter is the parameter of the Poisson, which says cell M13 here, because that's where I had that number stored. And I don't actually remember what the third zero is, uh, but I have it as zero in all of the cells. So if you want to use this, probably just Google it and remember what the third parameter is. For the normal distribution, I also want to mention, and I did type that in the IA, but I forgot to mention when we were looking at it, that the normal distribution is a continuous distribution and the number of goals in a match is a discrete. It has to be a natural number, like five goals. So the standard way to do that with a continuous distribution is that instead of asking the probability that the distribution is equals five, which will be zero, right? Instead of asking five, you ask from 4.5 to 5.5. So you make an interval around that natural number that you want with half of it to the left and half of it to the right. That is the standard way to do that. And this is what I'm doing in the cell here because the command is kind of like a cumulative distribution. So it goes up to cell A5 plus 0 0.5 like I typed over there because cell A5 is the number of goals and then plus 0 0.5 for the reasons that I was just describing. Then the next two parameters are the mean and the standard deviation of the normal distribution. Again, there's a fourth parameter there that is a one. I don't remember what that means. And then I'm subtracting from the sum of the previous cells in the column because I actually don't want the cumulative thing all the way until 5.5, right? I want it to go from 4.5 to 5.5 and I don't have that parameter over there where it starts. It just starts all the way at negative infinity and goes up to 5.5. And then I subtract the other ones that I had calculated before in order to leave it as just that interval. Binomial distribution, very similar. This is how the command works in Google Sheets. That's it.